Hey now, welcome to another edition of the Inside BS Show. I'm Dave Lorenzo, and today is the day that I've circled on my calendar. Well, I've had it circled for a really long time because I'm going to have some fun today. We're talking about a crisis in your business. Not my business, your business, and that's why I'm having the fun. Here's the thing. All of us are going to face an issue where we have to answer to shareholders or customers or maybe even in extreme cases, the media. What you say, how you say it, and how you handle those situations could be the defining moment in the life cycle of your business or even the defining moment of your career. If you want to know how to do it correctly, you got to stay with us because Dave Oates, a crisis communications expert, is my guest on this edition of The Inside BS Show. Dave, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you being here today. All the cool guys are named Dave. It's good to see you. That's it. Only the best are named Dave. <laughs> right. So listen, I need to know for the benefit of myself, for the benefit of the people watching and listening, what is crisis communications and how is it different from just your average regular PR? Yeah. So crisis communications is, I crashly say, when the stuff hits the fan, only I don't use stuff. But for business owners, executives, nonprofit, board members and the like. Crisis communication event occurs when something happens to you or your organization's reputation that disrupts operations. In other words, you can't do what you normally are supposed to do in your day-to-day -day activities because you've got employees questioning your authenticity, wondering whether they should stay with the company or go search for another job, whether you've got customers who have been maybe in some cases very loyal to you, have been repeat businesses, and now are questioning whether they buy from you at the frequency that they used to, or maybe at all, whether you've got business partners who are wondering if you're the type of organization that they should align with. Stakeholders are you know, shareholders and donors and things like that. Anything that is hitting the public domain, whether that's a blog, social media post, news article certainly is occasion, any of those type of, of activities that are causing reputations to be put on the line and your operations to be disrupted. That's when I usually get called in. Fantastic. All right. So I'll give the folks listening and watching an example and, and we can talk about specifically what, you know, what type of communications and how those communications need to be handled. And I'm going to give a goofy example first and then down the road, I'll give a little bit more serious example. When I was uh, when I was a little a little baby uh, GM in a hotel a hundred years ago, it's got to be twenty five years ago. We had it was a it was a courtyard by Marriott in Fishkill, New York, very small town, uh, about an hour and a half north of New York City. And the courtyard was the traditional courtyard, right? The building is shaped like a U and has a courtyard in the middle where there's a swimming pool. It's the middle of the summer, and we have pigeons nesting on our roof, Dave. Okay. So you know what pigeons do they, when they nest? They poop, and they poop all over. They, they're indiscriminate. They're, they're dive bombers. They will poop on anything and everything. It's a big problem when you're running a hotel with a pool if people are getting crapped on. Not a good guest experience. So I call our extermination company. Every hospitality organization has an extermination company that comes once a week. They take care of everything. And the guy's like, knowledgeable guy, he's like, well, you know, pigeons are a little tough. So we put up the plastic owls, right? So these birds crap all over the plastic <laughs> owl. They don't care about the plastic owl, okay? So the guy comes back, and I'm like, look, they're, they're, the, the birds are like literally sitting on the plastic owl, you know, like one perched on each shoulder, one on his head, crap everywhere. So he's like, all right, here's what we can do. For two weeks, we're going to put out cornmeal all over your roof. He's like, and then on the third week, we're going to put a little bit of poison in the cornmeal. And here's the thing. It's not going to kill the birds. It's just going to, it's going to persuade them to go feed elsewhere. <laughs> so what do I know, right? I, I don't know anything. So I'm listening to the expert. The guy's like, yeah, you know, put the poison in the cornmeal. Okay, fine. So for two weeks, every pigeon in Fishkill, New York is feeding on the roof of my hotel. Right. Okay. Hundreds of pigeons. Then week three comes. Within 10 minutes of this guy climbing down the ladder, I got pigeons falling out of the sky on guests' heads. <laughs> it was, Dave, it was so bad. People are taking pictures. The cops come. Somebody calls the local newspaper. Yeah. They got pictures. The next day, it was even worse. The next day, I got pickets from the yeah. Association for the Society of Prevention yeah. of Cruelty to Animals picketing my hotel. And all I was trying to do was keep poop off of my guests. So here we go. I call Dave Oates. 
Dave, I got birds falling from the sky. I got the newspaper. I got pickets. What the hell am I supposed to do? <laughs> and we're back with another Sandrowski Business Minute. And here with today's minute is my friend John Alfonsi. So, John, when is the best time and when is the worst time to sell a stock? If you're talking publicly traded stock, Dave, the old adage is buy low, sell high. Unless you're trying to short sell, then you want to do the opposite, buy high and sell low. Um, if you're dealing with a privately held business, there really is no best or worst time to sell the business other than the worst time would be if it's a forced sale. Um, if you wait too long for something to happen, um, get your ducks in order early, plan for succession or the transition of the business early. If you're talking about publicly traded stock, um, if you're trying to what we call tax harvest losses, when you're trying to sell uh, stocks at a loss to offset the gains, the worst thing that you could do is to sell your stocks at a gain in year one and sell the stocks at a loss in year two. The reason being you can't carry back capital losses, you can only carry them forward. So the best thing to do would be to sell your gains and your loss stocks in the same year. But if you can't otherwise do that, sell your loss stocks first because capital losses can be carried forward. Then you can always use them to offset the gains in future years. Wow, that's great advice, John. All right, if people want direct contact with you to ask this or any other business-related question when it comes to evaluation, how can they get a hold of you? You can reach us at our toll-free number of 866-717-1607 or reach us at our website, ccaadvisors.com or email me at jta at sensel, C-E-N-D-S-E-L dot -E com. All right, folks, that'll do it for this edition of the Sandrowski Business Minute. Thanks to John Alfonsi. We'll see you back here again with another Business Minute tomorrow. But remember... Sandrowski Corporate Advisors, they are a CPA firm with a different perspective. Yeah, and this one you own, you sort of own up to what you were trying to do. Look, we hired a qualified exterminator. We were trying to get the pigeons away from the guests and all of the excrement that they were placing, which was not conducive to good hospitality. We tried everything up to this point. And when we listened to the expert, this is what we were told. It obviously didn't go as planned. We apologize for that. We will rectify this situation. We will work on another way to ensure that the pigeons don't disrupt our guests, but at the same time, we don't disrupt the pigeons from living a happy and normal life. We apologize for that. I will tell you, my guess is, yes, you will certainly have those groups of uh, you know, societies who will take exception for that. And you will, you will likely not ever get them back. You didn't have them in the first place, right? But I would say by and large, most people would say, look, I certainly don't want to harm any birds unnecessarily, but I get what you were trying to do. It didn't work. Okay. Appreciate you being candid and forthright right away. We get it. And, you know, I, I think most people would sort of give it the benefit of the doubt because everybody has been dive bombed at one point by a pigeon, right? That's, <laughs> that, is, that is a universal yeah. truth. I don't care where you are. I don't care what age. You still remember the time when there was stuff that happened on your shirt, you're outside, right. and it's like, you know, you still remember that. But the key is, right, you got to own it. You got to express empathy for the people that are really upset about it and also the look of it, right? You, did, you weren't trying to harm birds, as you just said. You got to do it right away, and then you got to take action. If you don't respond right away with empathy and action, that crisis situation just balloons. And thank God, I'm assuming, because you talked about it like many, many moons ago, this is the age before social media, because that was yeah. contained to the local one, which you know, for a hotel is still not pleasant. But man, imagine if it's in the day and age, and this is where I get it, where everybody's a broadcaster with their phones, and I've got Instagram, and I've got TikTok, and I've got Facebook, and i got LinkedIn. And you are a worldwide phenomenon right now. So, you know, it, and that's the world in which I live in. It's, and that's why I tell people you got to respond in an hour because everybody's a broadcaster and that stuff will go viral before you know it. Yeah. And, you know, what we ended up doing, we were, I, you're so right. We were so lucky there was, there was no internet. I mean, there was internet, but nobody used it. It was yeah. for scientists and NASA right. engineers at that time. And, you know, there was nobody posting the pictures of that. It was in the paper. And we had to work really hard 
about a, about a week and a half later to have another story placed in the paper with us giving a donation to the ASPCA and all of our hotel workers volunteering to help. And there were pictures of us at animal shelters. It, you know, we worked really hard to, to get back in the good graces of the community because although there was no social media, everybody who lived in that, in that city who had their relatives come and stay with us for Thanksgiving was up in arms because of what we did. So we had to prove that we were still good citizens of the community. And, and, and that's part of the action plan, right? It's not only taking action to make sure that something like what had occurred never happens again, but taking action to give people the proper context as to the type of community partner you have been in the past and are still ascribing to be. And I think that gets lost on a lot of folks. A lot of organizations and the executives and the founders and so forth have made it to where they're at, largely because they possess two characteristics. And I know I'm overgeneralizing here, but stick with me. At the op overcoming the naysayers, right? The people who have said, this isn't going to work. You're not going to succeed. I don't know why you think you're going to be successful at this. And they've tuned them out and they've been able to focus the eye on the prize, right? The second thing is, if somebody has purposely thrown an obstacle in their way, they have barreled through it, around it, over it. They have figured out a way to continue going for that, and they've been a success for that. So that fight or flight mentality is inherent to a lot of people who have achieved some sort of professional success. And when it comes to a crisis situation, though, those two strong characteristics are actually to your detriment because you don't comment on a situation and allow the other narrative to sort of take hold, particularly in social media and the like or you are argumentative to the point where people feel validated by what they see or what they perceive you to be, which is an unfeeling and uncaring entity, individual or entity for that. So yeah, the empathy and then follow on by the action to prove that you are the person and the entity that you are, you espouse values, you wanna be good corporate citizens. Those are really, really important. And for a lot of organizations, it's just not anything that's sort of comes natural to them. And that's where I help out. Yeah, that's terrific. That's really great. One thing I'd like you to kind of coach us up on, Dave, because I see a lot of people doing this wrong, is giving a proper apology, right? The These whole qualified apologies drive me nuts. If somebody was offended, it was not our intention, and we do not, as a company, condone that type of behavior, and that's supposed to be an apology, right? What's a proper apology? I'm sorry. How about that, right? How about what your <laughs> parents told you to do beforehand, right? I'm sorry. My bad. I screwed up. You're right. Totally tanked that. The, and I get why people don't do that, right? Let's, let's, let me express a little empathy for those who don't give a proper apology. The first thing is that there's legal liability when you do that, right? I get a lot of times in a situation, I get hired by the attorney because they are trying to keep, you know, these type of conversations privileged because lawsuits are coming. Well, here's a newsflash. Yeah. The lawsuits are coming whether or not you directly apologize or not. And so limiting that liability to the detriment of your ability to keep your customers and keep your employees and keep your partners is something you've really got to balance. And even if it means that you have a little bit more in the lawsuit risk, your customers will look at you as saying, you know what? They owned it. They're forthright. They're candid. I am now comforted in thinking that they're still the same entity that has the same values that I was attracted to, which is why I decided to work here or started to buy your products or services. I'm going to stick with you, right? And and so that needs to be part of the of the narrative. And being forthright and candid is so important on that. And the second thing is if you don't want this thing to continue having multiple news cycles and blowing up on social media for weeks on end. You've got to just hit it hard in the beginning. Sometimes the best way through a crisis communications event is through it and just say, my bad. I, I'm not suggesting, let me just put this caveat in there, that organizations own up to things that for which they're not culpable. But for those things that they are, then they should own it right away. And if that means also taking responsibility for like, like you did, let's take that hotel example. You hired the vendor, right? You ultimately own that responsibility. The vendor wasn't qualified, or at least in this case, certainly certainly messed up the process and, and caused some of those birds to die. 
But ultimately, that's your responsibility. And the fact that you owned up to it right away made that a whole lot better and or certainly less worse than it could have been. Well, and my philosophy, not only in that situation, but anytime I get into a get into a jam is I just got to give them no place to go. I don't want to, I don't want to give them someplace to extend this story. And that leads kind of to my next question, Dave, talk about lying and lying in the, in the age of a bazillion fact checkers on Twitter and social media, who, if, if you're in the middle of something and you make a statement that every, and by the way, every statement can easily be fact checked now, crowdsource fact checked. So talk about lying in the age of social media and why it's a bad idea, if you think it's a bad idea. Yeah, so we, you know, 20 years ago, right, organizations would be very careful as to how they would parse words or, or not say complete truths, right? Even if they would say not lying, that the slippery ethics code is, well, I just, won't, I just won't give the full story, right? I can only give this amount. And there's a, real, there's a real fine line as to when that becomes lying. The issue is, to your point, we don't live in an age where I, as an organization, can buy advertisements, speak one way to an audience, and that's the only that's the only truth that's out there. That's the only mode of communication. Again, everybody's got these little funky devices that we now live in an age where everybody has a say at the table, whether you invited them or not. And so if you believe that you can control a message by by shaving different facts or omitting certain truths, or out and out lying, you will be called out on it faster than anything else. And again, my job, let's get back to the, the idea of crisis communications. My job is to help organizations get back to normal operations as quickly as possible, give them the give them a little bit of latitude to be able to fix whatever the issue was that caused the crisis, even if it was a misunderstanding and there wasn't anything malicious or, or, or negligent on that one, there's still an opportunity that needs to be rectified in order to get back to normal operations. And the more you try to stave it, stay, you know, shave off some of the facts, the more you try to sort of omit certain truths and not be completely upfront and transparent to the extent that you legally ha- you can, I, I, I think you're just doing yourself a disservice, and this only extends. And the let's get, let's get to the point. You will not get back to normal operations, and in fact, you will put yourself at a greater risk that you never will get back to normal operations, and you're out of a job. Period. Yeah. So tell us now, in a crisis situation, what what should you never ever do? What should you what should you not do? So people can get out their pens and paper now. Write these things down. This is exactly what you don't want to do if you're in a crisis. Yeah, th- there's there's three entities, right? And you'll probably hear me repeat this over and over again in the podcast. The first thing you, you want to never do is to not respond when there's a bona fide crisis communications and leave that narrative to somebody else, right? And more importantly is you want to respond in as quick of a manner as you can. So don't just think, well, I can bury my head in the sand. I've had way too many cases where organizations have done that. And maybe because the matter was small. Maybe it wasn't uh, an issue that sort of made mainstream news. But it is on medium.com posting. There's social media posts and things like that. You start to see it creep up. If you ignore it for long enough... Google will start to pay attention to that as it builds up a following. And before you know it, it will be the fir- one of the first things that people will see when they search for your name or your organization. And that will detract your current customers, your current partners, and future customers and partners, let alone employees, from actually doing business with you. So you got to respond to that one. You got to respond quickly. The second thing is you must always respond with empathy and action. We sort of talked about this already, but I don't care what the crisis is. I don't care what the organization is. I don't care the industry. I don't care what the size of the entity is. You have to respond in every crisis situation with empathy and action. Again, doesn't mean culpability, but if you do not do that, you won't diffuse the anxiety that an audience segment feels and you will only fuel that fire. And I've seen it beforehand, right? Again, you know, no comment or get a little bit of argumentative and it's like throwing gasoline on the fire. You just expand this conflagration and it just take longer to get out there. The third thing is you need to follow up with L- with examples of how you are rectifying this. And it doesn't mean you have to do a press release. It doesn't mean you have to do a broadcast on that. But the people in the audiences that were disenfranchised 
or at least skeptical now of not sure who you are because your reputation is being called in question, you've got to follow up and prove to them that you are what you have always pretended to be and in fact are even more committed to that. Those are the three things that I think you must do and, and, and then contrarily never do. Never, never just let it go and it's never a one and done. It's never something that you can wait, you know, a day or two to respond. You, you'll just you'll just make matters worse. Yeah, I think that's great advice, and I appreciate you giving it to to us uh, today. Let's talk about uh, situations where there really there really is no good outcome, right? And I'll share with you uh, later on in my career in the hospitality industry. Before I got into consulting, in fact, the thing that drove me into consulting was I had experience working with and negotiating uh, with unions. And I worked in New York City and in the hospitality industry, one of the things that happens is when there's an organizing event, meaning the, the employees have decided that they want to organize, they've, they've, the, the, the process is they fill out cards and then you have a certain period of time to hold an election. Generally, what the unions will do, and this is, I'm going to speak to my experience specific to New York, is you get a giant inflatable rat out in front of your, out in front of your place of business. And that, that rat represents you yeah. because you're not supposedly not treating your employees right. well. And what we would always try to do is if we knew we couldn't stop it, we would always try and negotiate with the unions. We would try to control the environment where the, the election was going to be held. We even in one hotel, we even let them sit in our cafeteria for a full year and lobby our employees because we knew the longer we extended the time, the longer we would have to convince the employees that they really didn't want somebody between them and us. But in most cases, in the cases where I worked, we would have this giant rat in front of us. And it gets press coverage because the rat is, it's iconic. It's its a giant, ugly rat. And usually our hotels were in great locations, so thousands of people would pass by. And what we would try to do is we would always try, the, the media, in my opinion, and I'm curious to see hear what you have to say, the media is always looking for a bad guy, Right. So if you're the person who's out there saying, hey, listen, we, we welcome the union in. We, we want to have a, a fair election. We want our employees to be able to make a fair choice. And these are the people who are trying to basically destroy our business by putting this giant inflatable rat out in front of us. We, we welcome this election. We want, it to be, we want it to be fair. But now these folks are disrupting our business and there's no telling what could happen as a result of that. That to me is giving the media someone else to look to as uh, as the quote unquote bad guy, and of course their you know their union rep was there with his megaphone on, on the back of a pickup truck and saying, well, if these people had just if they had just treated their employees fairly in the first place, we would have never had to be here, and you know, and our our fallback position was, hey, listen, we're doing everything we can to treat the employees fairly. We're going to let them have the the election here. Yeah, I, and you know that, and then the media will go will run to who they think is the bad guy. I, I have great respect for journalists and, and reporters, especially nowadays, because the pressure that they have to get news out and to get eyeballs on their stories, whether that's a blog article or broadcast or a YouTube video, is harder than ever because they're competing with, like we talked about, Joe Sixpack, who has a, an iPhone and pretends to be a influencer without any journalist credibility it's 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 as rough as can be so unfortunately the media stories nowadays are as much entertainment as they are anything else i need to make sure that i get the eyeballs on that well how do you get eyeballs you get eyeballs by conflict you get eyeballs by having the pro it, you know it's reality tv right you want to have a good guy you want to have a bad guy you want to have a sage it's it's no different than sports and that's just the reality particularly in mainstream press so if you again as an entity, like you just said, going back to the hospitality and the unions, if you play that by ha not having empathetic and action-oriented messaging, you will play right into that you know that formula that will cause the story to continue to grow legs, and people will look upon you as saying, "Yep, they're." They're the bad people. They're the ones not treating with that. I go a step further, too, not only with the messaging uh, saying, you know, we welcome the unions. We, we're looking forward to working with them. Obviously, we prefer them to not have the rat in there because I think it would be in our interest to continue to make sure that we are drawing business and that we are taking care of the guests because I think it would be in the interest, however they go with the unions, that we have a thriving, prosperous hotel that is creating jobs for really good people. But then I would also start putting out, and particularly nowadays on social media, 
all of the employee benefits and special activities that you're doing for them because it will support your position that, look, you want to treat employees fairly. This, they're the lifeblood of this of this entity. If they're not happy, they're not going to take care of our guests and we're not going to survive. It's the Southwest model, right? Southwest goes employees first, customers second, shareholders third, right? Because if you take care of the employees, they take care of the customers who will take care of the, you know, the shareholders will be taken care of. And if you can show that by way of example, through steady communications, again, following up with that entity with action, uh, your position is at least known. The narrative is properly said. It doesn't mean that the union still wouldn't get the votes that they want from the employees to come in, but I think you'd be certainly in a better position to continue to go and your reputation would be largely intact. Yeah. And one of the, just as an aside, one of the greatest strategies, and it probably wouldn't work today, but one of the greatest strategies we had in those situations is when the media was there, we would feed the people on the picket line because it was never our employees that were on the picket line. It was always people they brought in, probably executives from the union, and nobody ever turns food away. Yeah. So if the cameras are rolling, we're giving them pizza, we're giving them iced tea, lemonade to keep them cool. We're feeding the people, we're holding their picket signs while they eat the pizza. <laughs> I had a, I mean, I, it, it, you couldn't get a better optic than that. I had an office for about six years in this in this complex. And they were doing some retrofitting because the University of Phoenix, the online entity, had built, had had taken over some offices. So there were some tenant improvements that were going on in the building. And there was a discussion, I guess, from some of the unions in the electrical and the contract world is why they didn't use union employees. They, they used non-union employees. So so the union reps were, were picketing outside for a couple of hours a day. And uh, I would talk to the property manager. And I would say, well, what are you doing about that? She goes, oh, well, we've, we've got coffee and donuts for them. And they're like, hey, thanks very much and all of that. Because they go, look, we, 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 we get it, right? They're, they're, they've got their business entity. We've got ours. And, and you know, if, if we can at least, again, diffuse the situation a little bit, maybe they're here for two hours to state their case instead of four, right? And, and the media stopped covering it because it was, well, you know, this is what it is. And they did it once and then they're done. And again, that's crisis communication. I'm not trying to make something necessarily go away. I'm just trying to limit the amount that it continues to conflagrate so you can get back to normal operations as quickly as possible, period. And, you know, that's that is that's brilliant. I, you know, that the, the the minimization of that is is the name of the game at that point. And feeding them and having people feed them on camera makes it a non-story. Nobody wants to watch guys giving pizza to other people. Nobody cares about that. They care about people screaming and yelling at each other, which we weren't going to do. I'll, I'll give you another example. It was an entity, this is outside of hospitality, but it was an entity that's very visible and I'd worked with them for about a year. Uh, and uh, there was part of this organization had a charity arm and they had this big high-end golf tournament that they put on at the uh, last summer. So. They do it annually. 2020 obviously curtailed that because of COVID and not being able to gather. They went back to it in the late summer of 2021. The CEO gets up there uh, and is just thrilled that everybody's there. And he said, man, I'm so thankful that we get here to raise money for this wonderful youth cause that they have in there. And I'm really sorry we couldn't do it last year because of the China virus. And everybody stopped. Now, there, I wanna talk through this. There were no television cameras. There were no journalists there were no uh nobody was really in a position where you know where they were broadcasting you know and, and recording on there but nevertheless it was a it was a public forum with enough people on there that somebody tipped off a news reporter uh a few months later and so we're asked to do a statement i'm getting in with the front office and there's two camps of arguments one was saying hey there's no recording there's no entity. We don't, you know, we don't have to say anything like, you know, they've got nothing. And I said, if you want this thing to go away, we do just what the CEO did when somebody came up to him after, right after he said that at the golf tournament and said, hey, I know it was a slip of the tongue, but you really shouldn't have said that. And he profoundly apologized right then and there. He goes, you know, that was a slip of the tongue. I meant nothing by it. I'm I'm sorry. I, I should have chosen my words carefully. And so when they asked for a statement, I said, that's what we go with. And so we had the statement from the CEO essentially saying that, saying, as I told people over there, I'm sorry, that was a poor choice of words. I meant nothing by it. I know that's a, people took 
that is disrespectful and for that i humbly apologize i'll make sure not to have that happen again the story went national right and everybody's worried about oh this is this is going to go national and it did the reporter picked it up it went there it was gone in four hours there was no follow-up to that everybody moved on yep i said it screwed up my bad dumb thing to say i won't do it again period end of story we moved on and he moved on and and that's that's what I tried to get through people is, you know, sometimes the best ways to go through it. It's a little bit pain, but it's certainly a whole lot less than if you were to go what would be the natural, again, fight or flight route that a lot of a lot of entities will do just by their, you know, by their past successes in going that route. Do you remember, Dave, the the story about Hugh Grant? Now, oh, yeah. Hugh Grant is a yeah, famous actor. Yeah. So. For those of you who don't remember, and Dave's going to fill in a lot of the details for me because I'm a little sketchy on the details. I haven't watched the the, the summary of the story in a long, long time. So you, Grant, who everybody knows, who's a he's you know he's a very famous actor now. He's in a lot of stuff, gets a lot of work, commands a very nice fee for all the movies he's in, has a following. I think it was in New York, right? And he uh, it, maybe it, it was L.A. It was L.A. He, it, it was L.A. It was L.A. Okay, and he um, he was uh, he was engaged in the services of a prostitute, mm -hmm. and I guess he got caught, right? So fill in the story from here, Dave. So Take he got so here. he got caught. He got arrested, and and they had the police had you know the block you know the 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 mugshot that he had in there, and his hair's disheveled, and he's looking he's looking obviously embarrassed and ashamed and all of that. And um, and he was dating at the time the actress Elizabeth Hurley, who was more famous than he. He was he was a a known actor, but you're right, he wasn't sort of the famous one that he had in there. And and it was really embarrassing. And you're right, the natural inclination in a lot of cases for publicists is to rally flags. Well, that's you know, it's he, he's going to profess his innocence. We're taking this to court. We have no further Go comment at the time, right? And. And to Hugh Grant's credit, the next, he puts out a statement that, because this was late night, puts out a statement that following morning that says, I've embarrassed a lot of people, including myself. I'm, I am so sorry for my actions and particularly to my lovely girlfriend, Elizabeth. And I think they were, they might have been married, but, but then they split up afterwards, obviously, but Elizabeth Hurley, and I'm sorry. But the catalyst for that was, he was scheduled to go on the Tonight Show with Jay Leno, that was at the time the most popular late night talk show in in the in America. This is almost thirty years ago. He went on that night, and Jay Leno, first question he had, I still remember it. He goes, "Let me start with question number one." And, he, and Jay Leno turned to Hugh Grant and he said, "What the hell were you thinking?" And the crowd laughed, and Hugh took it, and then and then came back and saying, "I wasn't." It was a dumb thing to do. It was stupid. I've got some soul searching to do. I heard a lot of people. I'm sorry. On what was at that time the biggest national stage, television stage, in in America, and he did that. He did that within 24 hours. And as you say now, his career really never took a blip. He did. He he continued it took making off. movies. And he, he became a sympathetic figure. Right. Everybody, you know, there but for and, and maybe that's the point to bring up there is everybody everybody plays the idiot, right? We've all done things in our lives for which we're not proud. And maybe some of us who have a little bit of gray hair know that we did so in many cases before social media. Well, now we have to be as transparent as we can when we own it. And most people if you are as open and transparent as you can be without violating the privacy laws of others, you will find yourselves in more cases than not having an audience that will empathize with you. There but for the grace of God go I. It doesn't mean everybody is going to rally to your cause, right? Haters are going to hate. You're going to get a small amount of people that are just going to call you so many different names and think of you as the second coming of the devil. And that's just... That's just the reality of it, right? I mean, if I put a YouTube video up with kittens, right, I'm going to get a thousand thumbs up and I'll get five thumbs down. I don't know what their problem was, but that's just the reality of it. But by and large, the majority of the people are going to give you a second chance because we all know what it's like to be in that, in that position or at least can empathize.
Absolutely. We're speaking with Dave Oates. If you want to reach out to him, you can call him at 858-300-6168. 858-300-6168. Dave is a crisis communications expert. So Dave, in the in the few minutes we have left, I want you to I want you to talk about what it's like to handle um, just minor crises that could blossom into bigger crises. So, for example, like a couple of bad reviews online could suddenly turn into a, just a total disaster for you, your personal reputation or your business. What do you advise your clients to do when they get dinged with, you know, they have a bad day and they have a couple of bad reviews from that day and everybody keeps piling on? Yeah, I appreciate that because I do that for clients as well, big and small. The first thing you need to do is you need to answer it. Right. If it's a Yelp review, let's say, and you get a one or two star and somebody calls out something that happened and it's legitimate. Well, I can talk about the ones that aren't legitimate, but let's let's talk about the legitimacy of that. Then the organization should first off be monitoring those review sites and there's software programs you can get or you can get a service that's relatively cheap. I, I, I've got a service I do for 500 bucks a month that can monitor that when you see those things. Um, pop up, you need to be able to respond quickly. And again, with empathy and action, we're sorry, the experience didn't meet your expectations, or you're right, we messed this up, we would like to, we would like to see how we can make this better. We'd like to see what we can do for that one there. Let us call you and let us contact you for doing that there. Now, again, I say this with the full understanding that sometimes the customer will be so ticked off, you won't get them back and or you will not uh, be able to rectify the situation to their liking. That's okay because you tried. And so for everybody else who is going on that review site and looking at that, they will understand that you put forth the effort to do so, especially if it's in context with all sort of other positive reviews you have on there. If you've got five, you know, three or four star review, or four or five star reviews, if we go to that Rubik's, and you have one one or two star reviews and you've tried to make amends most people will give you the benefit of the doubt everybody has a bad day but you have to respond with empathy and action and do that now one other caveat though because you get a lot of people who go hey yeah but half of those negative reviews are all bs right they're not legitimate clients they're they're a rival they're they're a competitor who's just trying to soil you know that that online review sites because people use it when they make when they're making purchase decisions, and to that I say you can still respond in an empathetic and action oriented way that telegraphs to everybody else this night not night might not be real. Let's take an example. You get a one star. It's it's a bogus review. You think it really is, and you can still respond by saying, "Man, we're really sorry. You had a we didn't have a really good experience. We'd love to rectify that." By the way, we can't find you in our records as a customers. Would you call this number and please let us know so we could we can correlate that. Again, you're telegraphing to everybody else who's on that site that you may not want to take this review at face value. It might be a bogus one there. That will go a long way. But I see a lot of organizations that will say, that's ah, a racket. I'm not I'm not going to dignify it with the response. Again, that flight mode, right? Or when they respond, they go, well, you didn't do this, you didn't have this, you didn't do this, you didn't do this. And they're like a point counterpoint debate. That doesn't get you anywhere. That only exacerbates the anxiety and the animosity and validates in many respects to the people that are on there that maybe this reviewer is right. Maybe I've touched a nerve and maybe it's maybe this entity isn't what they what they try to pretend to be. And and maybe I'll take my business elsewhere. So it's an art, but it's one that follows the same discipline that we talked about with media relations. More to the point, most organizations are going to find that the next crisis PR that they're going to face is going to be an online review, a negative social media post or a blog that then elevates to Google at some point. I think everybody thinks crisis communications is only when the news crews are coming in with the cameras, knocking on the door, pushing in. That that does happen, and I've dealt with plenty of that. But for most organizations, the small to mid-sized entities, and even the large ones, the crisis communications issue that they will face, if they haven't already, is going to be something that posts online that they ignored. Yeah. Dave, talk to folks now who are, um, who, who are not typically in the public eye, but tend to have a high profile in a specific industry, right? So maybe they're an association president yeah. and the association has 10,000 members, yeah. or maybe they're a speaker. Somebody, you know, somebody like me who goes around and yeah. gives 35, 40, 50 speeches a year. Very few people know, you're not going to get recognized in an airport, right? right? But the people in your industry know you, you have a high profile in your industry. 
Speak to those folks now about how important it is to realize that you mentioned several times you held up your phone, that everybody's got a phone. You're never off stage right. when you have a high profile position. I don't care if you're the pastor of a church that has 300 congregants or you're a fifth grade teacher. If you're getting up in front of people and sharing information, you're going to be considered a high profile person. What counsel do you give to those people who have their own personal brand they need to watch out? You, you, you need to manage it like an asset that you would for your company, right? It's as important and probably I would say more important, particularly if you're in the services um, business. And, and when I say services, I mean anything where I'm not necessarily selling a product, but people are buying from me. So you mentioned a pastor of a community church, right? To me, that's a service business in its very broad sense. And I don't mean to denigrate people of faith and, and say that the church is not, but if you are paying tithing to this, right? If you are a member of, a, of an organization and you feel value spiritually getting that, that's a service business. And that asset of that pastor, that founder of that church, who is, who is um, distributing content online as well as in person has to recognize that their brand is what is driving members people feel connected to that individual or to the team around that that pastor that uh keeps them coming back right keeps them as members keeps them attending various services and volunteering for other entities and donating in some cases to certain causes that the church is carrying on and if you don't monitor that, if you don't manage that, if you don't have regular communications, and you also don't plan for what if somebody takes exception to you and posts something negative on that that causes a question, if you don't have those things in place like you would for the other risk management for your building on emergency preparedness and fire and security and all this sort of stuff there, you, you are putting that at a big risk at a time when if it does actually come into a crisis mode, it could it could take down an organization quickly. I, I we've lost count how many times a well known, well established person within their circle of friends, right, is is no more overnight. And and let me let me emphasize one other point. You're right. Again, twenty years ago, right, only the most widely known people that would get in the newspaper and the tele local television stations were the ones you had to worry about that well because everybody is now their own broadcaster they can segment the type of ent contacts and entities and follow people they would have never been able to do beforehand so while it's not the broad attraction you are still a very visible entity and brand to the people that are putting money in your pocket or giving you opportunities. And so you have to look at that as in that little world, that's all people mat that that's all that people matter, you know, care about. And that is something that you have to look at in the same way that a large entity is looking at what's going on CNN today. All right. So last uh, thing that I think we should touch on because it, it, it affects a lot of people. We have a lot of professionals who watch the show, who listen to the show, and that's the old rumor mill, right? <laughs> What do you do if you're the victim? And I, you know, it's it's funny. I, I I deal with this from time to time when I when I work with large professional service organizations. You know, there's a there's a you know a political situation. Somebody's up for partner, and then the rumor mill gets going. And I also dealt with it. My my son had an issue with some kids at school that were saying something about him that wasn't true. Mm. What is your what is your counsel to people who are in that closed environment and the and the rumor mill gets going and I don't know if it's productive to find where the rumors are starting from and squash them how do you handle that when it's just it's just everywhere I, you have to address it in the same way you'd address a news uh, reporter's inquiry because unfortunately in a lot of circles with social media the two lines have been blurred so much that they become almost unrecognizable right that's why i think there's such a pervasiveness for what people call fake news right you can still fact check situations and people will do that but you'll have a core entity that will believe whatever they believe because i can segment the type of content that i get on my phone to confirm a bias right even if it's not based in fact and I've got very smart people, very friends who will do that. I'll have conversations like that's that's not even true, but that's the reality of that. So when you have a rumor that is floating around there, you have to address that 
as you would a reporter. You have to set the record straight, and you have to do so, again, with the same empathetic and action-oriented messaging. Maybe there's a reason why the rumor mill started, because you haven't been as communicative as you should be. There has been somebody who should not have had you know, that microphone that maybe you need to think about how information gets exchanged internally or things like that. But I think ignoring it is a real risk because that becomes, again, the truth by default in an area where I can share garbage at a, with my finger without batting an eye and not even slowing down my step if I'm walking to the Starbucks for my triple shot sugar-free vintage, you know, soy vanilla latte or whatever, right? So that's, you have to look at it in those terms anymore. And people are going, well, that's not, that's not right. And that's not, that's, that's really wrong. And society is, is crumbling as a result for that. You know, that's a really good conversation to have another day, but I'm in the crisis communications business and I'm dealing with reality for entities that are trying to stay in business for individuals that are trying to preserve their brand and for good deserving organizations that are trying to do some nonprofit, you know, uh, mission. And I, you, we can argue society, we, you know, we can debate the societal impacts all we want. And I think we should, but you know, having that theoretical, I guess, academic debate at a time when you just have to address the rumor is, is probably not productive. And when, Dave, do they call you? How how bad a situation or is there a situation that's too small? Who's Who should call you and when should they call you? So I I appreciate that. I, I always say the sooner you call me, the better. And, and if it's percolating on there or it's causing concern and you're stopping it, whatever is a normal operation, you're saying, huh, I wonder where that's going. I, I really... I hope it doesn't go any further. It probably won't. But I hope if you start having those conversations, that's the time to call. Because there's always opportunities to look at something and say, okay, maybe we can fix this communication issue early on so it doesn't become a crisis. And even if we can't, at least let's be prepared if it does blow up. Half of the crisis communication strategies I put together for organizations are ones that never see the light of day because we're preparing for something. Because if it's bad, you will have, like we talked about, an hour to get something in there. And, and trying to figure out what you're going to say, who's going to say it, and how at the time of a crisis is, is not optimal. Nine times out of ten, that's when I get the call, right? But I always say, call me early enough. As to the size of the organization, I literally have everything from half a billion dollar entities in healthcare and entertainment and sports and uh, manufacturing to independent mom and pop veterinary shops and so forth like that. I've got on my website, you can you can check on there, make a book an appointment for 15 minutes if you're a small entity. I love what I do. And even if it's 15 minutes and it's just something where I give a couple of pieces of advice because you can handle it because you're a corner store, your livelihood is dependent on that restaurant. I'll, I'll be happy to give you that 15 minutes of time as my schedule permits, if only to stave off there. I know what it's like to be a business owner. I know what it's like to start something like that. And and I love spreading that karma. If there's something that I think I can help with and it's something that you know somebody is willing to pay for, yeah, th sure. But that for those type of conversations, I'm just happy to help. All right, now, Dave, there's one more thing I think that we need to address, sure. and I'm gonna do it because I know you're too much of a gentleman. You would never bring this up. Here's Here's the thing about calling somebody like Dave. You may have, if you're a, if you're an organization of any size, you may have PR, a PR team in-house and, or you may have a corporate publicist and they're great at what they do. And what they do is they communicate with your shareholders and mm -hmm. they help your CEO with his speeches and they make sure that the organization is always putting the best foot forward in the public. Those are not people who are generally going to be the right people to handle crisis communications for a couple of reasons. And here's here's my thoughts, and then I'll turn it over to Dave because, you know, Dave is too much of a gentleman to bring this up and, and you know, uh, talk bad about his fellow brethren in communications. Number one, your corporate PR people, they don't want to be the face of the bad stuff. Right. They're going to have to go back and communicate with the shareholders later on. So you don't want them going out there and trying to handle some sort of a total crap show. All right. Number two, they're not, they're not experienced enough in handling this sort of thing. They're not looking for 
what the media knows that they don't know yet, so they're liable to step in it and maybe even make the situation worse. And the third reason you don't want your corporate PR team handling this is because you need them behind the scenes handling all the internal noise that's gonna be going on as the external noise takes place. Dave, I know you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't throw a corporate PR person under the bus, but you're really better equipped to handle this because you can handle it and go away. True or false? I don't think I'm I'm throwing entities under the bus. I get referrals from these entities, from corporate PR people, from from what I'll call PR agencies that do the proactive stuff. And they prefer to stay in that lane. I, I have the unique um, background, and I'm grateful for it, of being a Navy officer, and specifically a Navy public affairs officer. Crisis was just part of the of the job that's from, well, that's when you call the navy from when there's a day problem. one right hot war environments <laughs> environmental and then we had various mishaps and accidents and things like that in the course of my career and you know i the, i learned an early age on this one it is a it is a discipline not not as um widely understood and experienced uh in the pr realm as you would think more to the point i get a lot of pr people go that's not fun for me and in truth I find it enjoyable, and, and I know everybody's like, "You're a twisted guy." I, okay, maybe, but but it's a time in which organizations and entity really need somebody who can understand how to communicate effectively to get back to normal operations. And I feel most of value for the organizations that are willing to be open, transparent, honest, express the empathy and actions. And those who don't, I figure out pretty quickly, and I go, "Look, I'm not a public defender. I'm not here to be a human shield. If you're looking for that one, just continue what you're going to do." I throw those fish back in the pond, and and maybe you should go find somebody else to do so. So, no, I, I get, I get a handful of referrals every year from other PR practitioners, and and in doing so, when somebody asks me like, "Hey, I, I've got this great event coming up there. I'd like you to promote it. I'd like you to get PR," that's not me, right? You got to stay in your lane. So I'm happy to. to to refer that entities out to people who do that every day. Well, perfect. First, let me say thank you for your service. I appreciate that. Uh, we all appreciate your service to the country. So thanks very much. I want you to think of three things that we should take away from our time together. I'll give you a minute to do that. I'm going to remind folks that we're brought to you by my revenue roadmap guide. So listen, you, you're listening to a great show here. You got a lot of value out of this. If you have an issue and you want to build a marketing plan, you have an issue where you, you're just not growing in your business and you want to do something different. I want you to take a look at my revenue roadmap guide. It's hundred percent free. Go to this website, revenue roadmap guide.com revenueroadmapguide.com. Enter your contact info. You can download it for free. It's the same guide I use with my clients. I customize it for them. You can customize it for yourself and your business. It's a seven-step guide to building a marketing plan that will help you attract clients. And it focuses on relationships. We're not talking about doing any cold calls in there. We're not talking about doing billboards or bus bench advertising. We're really focused on building relationships. It's a seven-step plan to help you do that. Go to revenueroadmapguide.com. Enter your contact info there, and you can download it today for free. It's my gift to you for watching and listening to the show. My guest today is Dave Oates. He's a crisis communications expert. If you're not convinced that you need to hire him for your next crisis, and there will be a next crisis, you're nuts because he's given you a ton of value today. Reach out to him by calling 858-300-6168, 858-300-6168. Okay, Dave, what are the three things that the folks who are listening, the folks who are watching should take away from our time together? Number one, your crisis communication event that you'll likely face will occur online. It'll be something where there'll be an, uh, a poor online review. Uh, errant social media post, a poor, you know, a very disparaging blog or something like that, that if you don't know has occurred, you need to put in systems in place to monitor that because that will fester and likely be the thing that, that causes disruptions in your operations as opposed to the television news crews and big events that will come in there. Point number one. Point number two is you've got an hour when you start to see those things start to percolate to respond or at least plan for that. Don't wait a full day. Don't wait a day and a half for that. And the third thing is always respond with empathy and action. Again, doesn't mean you have to make culpability, but if, you're if your messaging and your statements are devoid of empathy and action, you will likely just make matters worse. Those are the three takeaways from our time. Dave, this has been just a ton of fun. Thanks for the time. Oh, no. Thank you, Dave, for being here. This is one of my favorite topics, and you handle it so well. You're the best. Thanks for joining us today, folks. Dave Oates, if you want to reach out to him once again, let me give you his number. It's 858 
800-618-6168. Dave, thank you for joining us today on the Inside BS Show. It's been fun. Thanks, Dave. All righty, folks, that'll do it for another episode of the Inside BS Show. I'm Dave Lorenzo. We'll see you right back here again tomorrow. Until then, here's hoping you make a great living and live a great life.